Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation for uh, chapter 2. This chapter is about chemistry and you can see this picture is an atom. Uh, we're going to go into the into the atom. Uh, this isn't a chemistry course but we do have to understand some basics of chemistry before we can talk about cells and, and bigger things. So this chapter is called Chemistry Comes Alive, and we're going to focus on chemistry as it relates to biology. But we've got to start with some basics. Um, if you had have not had a chemistry class in a while, I would suggest you go to the uh, on the Mastering A and P website. Go to the Get Ready for A and P website, and there's a chemistry review chapter. Uh, otherwise, this might be all very foreign to you. So let's go ahead and get started. First, we need to know a few definitions. Anything that has mass and takes up space is called matter. So you're made up of matter. Uh, the computer you're watching this on is made up of matter. Everything's made up of matter. The smallest stable units of matter are called atoms. Atoms have a nucleus and an electron cloud, and they're made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the picture you saw at the start of this presentation was a, a drawing of an atom. You can't actually see atoms. They are too small, uh, but that's an idea of, of what they look like. So let's look at the parts of an atom. Here's one way to, to depict an atom. Um, in the middle, we have what's called the nucleus, and it's made up of protons and neutrons. And then around this, we have electrons, and it's showing that there's two electrons there, here and here. But in reality, those electrons are constantly in motion. So these electrons, they have a charge of negative one, uh, and their mass is one eighteen thousandth the mass of a proton or a neutron. For our purposes, we're going to say they have a mass of zero. And they are found in the electron cloud, so they're somewhere around the nucleus. But they're always in motion, so we can't really see them. So electrons have a charge of negative, negative one, a mass of zero, and they're found in the electron cloud. Then neutrons have a charge of zero, they're neutral. They have a mass of one, and it's one atomic mass unit because they're so small we had to make up a, a unit to measure them. And they're found here in the nucleus. Uh, then protons have a charge of plus one, so positive one, and they have a mass of one as well, and they're found in the nucleus. And here's another way of, so here's one way of looking at the atom where the, here's the electron. But in reality, we know it's somewhere in this cloud. Okay, so that's an atom. Sometimes atoms interact to combine a molecules. So a molecule is formed when atoms interact and form larger, more complex structures. So here's the simplest atom we can get. That's a hydrogen gas. Two atoms have come together, and they are sharing these electrons, and that's called a bond. We're going to talk about bonds in a minute. Uh, before we get to that, some more things to know. Um, the number of protons in an atom is called the atomic number. So there are over 100 uh, different what we call elements and each element it's determined by the number of protons it has and that's its atomic number. Then the total number of protons and neutrons is the mass number. And a pure substance consisting of atoms with the same atomic number is an element. And that's what there's over a hundred elements. Uh, the one or two letter shorthand for each element is the chemical symbol. Um, you've 
probably heard of AG. AG is the uh, chemical symbol for silver. Uh, everybody's familiar with H2O. Before we get to this, everybody's familiar with H2O. The H is the chemical symbol for hydrogen, and the O is the chemical symbol for oxygen. All right, we have some, next we have some review questions. And uh, if you were in a face-to-face -face lecture, I call these wake-up questions. So this is to see if you've been paying attention. And the identical building blocks for each element are called... And if you need more time to think about it, just pause the movie, because I'm going to tell you the answer. And the, for each element, the correct answer is atoms. Okay, electrons have a charge of, and if you need more time, pause the video. Electrons have a charge of minus one. All right, next question. Neutrons have a charge of, and if you need more time, pause the video. They have a charge of zero. They're neutral. Uh, protons have a charge of, and if you need more time, pause the video. They have a charge of plus one. Okay, electrons have a mass of, and if you need more time, pause the video. For our purposes, it's zero. And protons have a mass of, if you need more time, pause it. The correct answer is one. Neutrons have a mass of, and if you need more time, pause it. The correct answer is one. And which of the following are, no are located in the nucleus? And if you need more time, pause it. Uh, the correct answer is Protons and neutrons, so E, A and B is the correct answer there. Okay. Now, now we're going to talk about isotopes. So atoms that contain the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes. Uh, if you've ever watched The Simpsons, that's the name of their uh, town baseball team. Um, some of these isotopes are radioactive, and those are actually useful. That's how we get nuclear power. Um, so here's, here's hydrogen, one proton, and this is the normal hydrogen that we will mainly see in nature. But this is also hydrogen, but now it's got a... Uh, a neutron added to it. So this is called hydrogen 2 or deuterium and it's still hydrogen but its mass number is 2. This is called tritium. It's got two neutrons added. It's still hydrogen because it still has that plus one positive charge uh, but now its mass number is 3. So that's an isotope. And again, some of those are useful. We use radioactive isotopes for making nuclear energy. Uh, the mass of an atom is its atomic weight. So if, if an element was pure and it consisted of just hydrogen 1 with no isotopes, its mass would be 1.00000. But in nature, in reality, we find some of the isotopes, so some of the deuterium, and some of the tritium. So the the average mass of all of these hydrogen atoms plus their isotopes that we find in nature, that is the atomic weight. And you can see it's a little bit more than one. Okay, the principal elements of the human body. Uh, the biggest one is oxygen. See, 65 percent. The next biggest one is carbon, uh, then hydrogen and nitrogen. Those are the four main ones, and there are some others that are in the body in much lower amounts. Just in case you were to 
You should know those four for the test. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Alright, most atoms have the same number of protons and neutrons, so they are electrically neutral. They have the same number of positive charges and negative charges. Uh, so on the well, both of these, one proton, one electron, it's electrically, electrically neutral. And electrons occupy energy levels called electron shells. So here would be the first electron shell. And as the atoms get bigger, they have more electrons and they need more electron shells to fit those. So here's lithium. It's got two electrons in the first shell and one electron in the second shell. Um, here's neon. It's got two electrons in the first shell and eight electrons in the second shell. And electrons always want to have their outermost electron shell filled. This is called the octet rule. So neon has its outermost shell filled. It's happy. Um, helium has its outermost shell filled. It's happy. And these are what are called inert elements. They're not going to react. Over here, these... Hydrogen and lithium, they do not have their outermost shell filled, so they are not happy. Um, so they will be reactive. They'll participate in chemical reactions. Helium and neon won't. Alright, next thing we need to talk about is ions. And ions are going to be really important for this course. Um, ions is how electricity is stored and moved in the body and we're going to talk about how ions um, allow us to send action potentials so so you really need to understand ions so when an atom gains or loses an electron it has a charge and it's called an ion in this case a sodium has one electron in its outermost shell so it's not happy um, if it loses that one electron, then it will have eight electrons in its outermost shell, and it's happy. So it will do that. It will give up an electron, um, and now it's called a sodium ion. And since it lost an electron, now it has a positive charge. A positive ion is called a cation, and a negative ion is called an anion. So chlorine... Uh, has seven electrons in its outermost shell, so it can gain an electron from something like a sodium atom. Then it will have eight electrons in its outermost shell. Now it's stable, uh, but it, since it gained an electron, it has a negative charge, and it's called an anion. So we'll, we'll see ions later on in this course. So an ion is just a, a charged particle. It's got either a positive or a negative charge. Okay, uh, next topic is bonds. Um, these are some ions, sodium and chlor chloride. It's the chlorine atom, chloride ion. Um, and since they have opposite charges, they're attracted to each other. So a bond created by the attraction of anions and cations, that is called an ionic bond. And because they're positive on all sides, they form these crystals. So that's the first type of bond is ionic. Uh, the next type of bond is called covalent. A bond created by electron sharing between two atoms is called covalent. So you can see these two hydrogen atoms are sharing these electrons. That makes them feel like their outermost electron shell is full. Um, here's with oxygen, you can see this nucleus right here. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So even though its outermost shell isn't full, it, it's sharing these electrons, so that makes it seem full and that makes it happy. Um, and we can see here is carbon dioxide sharing electrons. Um, a covalent. A covalent bond like these where the electrons are shared equally 
is called nonpolar. There are also some atoms like this, this is water, where the electrons are shared unequally, and this is called a polar covalent bond. And since we have more positive charges here in this in the nucleus of the oxygen atom, then we have so there's eight positive charges there and there's only one positive charge here in the hydrogen atoms. Um, the electrons are attracted to the positive charge since they're negative so they spend more of their time in this part of the atom than they do in this part over here. So that gives this part of the atom a partial negative charge. That's what that delta means, that it's a partial negative charge. And then this part of the atom has a partial positive charge. And these give, these give water some of their cool properties that we're going to talk about in a minute, these polar bonds. Okay, water can exist, or sorry, matter can exist as a solid, such as ice, a liquid, such as water, or a gas, such as water vapor. Uh, something that has a fixed shape and a fixed volume is called a solid. Then the next state is a liquid. Liquids have a changeable shape and a fixed volume. So that's water. And then the third state, gases, have a changeable shape and a changeable volume. So those are the, the three states of matter that we'll see and that we need to know. Alright, attractions between polar molecules form hydrogen bonds. So that's another type of bond. Uh, hydrogen bonds are not strong enough to form molecules. Uh, you can see these two water molecules are not joined together, but they're attracted to each other. The partial positive charge here is attracted to the partial negative charge here. And this gives water some of its cool properties. Um, one of those is surface tension. So this is a water strider, and it can float on top of the water because the surface of water is, is held together by these hydrogen bonds. That's what allows water striders to walk on the water. Um, another thing water is good for it's, is it's a very good solvent. Uh, so here we're dissolving sugar in water. Most things can be dissolved in water. But since our blood is mostly water, that's good. We can dissolve most things in our blood and transport them around our body. All right, have some questions. So what state of matter has a changeable shape and fixed volume? Changeable shape and fixed volume would be liquid. Uh, a bond where electrons are shared unequally is called, and the correct answer is polar covalent. Uh, which of the following is not one of the four main elements making up the human body? And the correct answer is sodium. Okay, next topic is chemical reactions. So cells remain alive and functional by controlling chemical reactions. During chemical reactions, reactants are rearranged into different substances called products. And we'll see some examples of chemical reactions in a minute. Uh, the sum of all the reactions happening in all of your cells is called metabolism probably heard of metabolism. Some people have a high metabolism and some people have a slower metabolism. Well that simply means all the reactions happening in your cells. And all the essential activities of a cell involve chemical reactions. So things like maintenance and repair, growth, division, and special functions that the cell might have. These all involve chemical reactions. couple more concepts we need to know. The movement of an object or change in the physical structure of matter is called work. 
and the capacity to perform work is called energy. This guy's using energy to move that weight. Uh, the energy of motion is called kinetic energy. And stored energy is called potential energy. So if you're not familiar with these terms, um, you're going to hear them again. All right, next thing we need to talk about is uh, chemical notation. Chemical notation is an efficient way to describe chemical reactions. So we could say, could write all this out. Two molecules of hydrogen gas plus one molecule of oxygen gas produces two water molecules. Or we could do this. And if you understand chemical notation, this means the exact same thing. It's a lot faster to write though. So chemical equations will contain the number. There's the number. And if there's not a number there, you just assume that it's one. And the type. So you've got two hydrogens and one oxygen uh, reacting substances. And then this arrow tells us that this on the left side of the arrow, we put the reactants, and on the right side, we put the products. And it also tells us the relative amounts of reactants and products. So in this case, two hydrogen ions, or sorry, two hydrogen atoms plus one oxygen atom produces two water molecules. All right, we're going to look at some types of chemical reactions. The first type is called a decomposition reaction. And a decomposition reaction breaks a molecule into smaller fragments. So bonds are broken. Uh, we can see this molecule is broken down into A and B. Uh, some decomposition reactions involve water, and those are called hydrolysis reactions. All of these reactions that break bonds, they're collectively called catabolism, and they usually release energy. And that energy is usually released in the form of heat. Okay, next type of reaction would be a synthesis reaction. A synthesis reaction assembles smaller molecules into larger ones. So in this case, bonds are formed. So here are the two parts, A and B, are combined to this molecule, AB. Um, some of these involve water. Those are called dehydration synthesis reactions, where two products are formed and we produce a water molecule. And these reactions uh, collectively are called anabolism. And these usually require energy. Then the next type of reaction is an exchange reaction. So in an exchange reaction, parts of molecules are shuffled to produce new products. So the bonds are rearranged. Some, bond, some bonds are broken and some bonds are formed. Okay, so those are the three types of reactions. Now for a reaction to start, we need what's called activation energy. That's the energy needed to start a reaction. So on the left here, we've got relative energy level. Here's the energy of the reactants, and here's the energy of the product down here. Now, this would happen except for there's this uh, activation energy that you have to overcome to get the reaction to start. Um, in our body, we use lots of enzymes, and enzymes will lower that activation energy, uh, usually by uh, just bringing things closer together. So an enzyme lowers activation energy. Uh, and enzymes in our body, in our cells, are arranged in metabolic pathways. Here's an example of a metabolic pathway. So this enzyme is going to convert A into B. This enzyme is going to convert B into C, and this could go on and on to make a more complex molecule um, or some kind of product that the cell needs. 
Um, and before we before we leave reactions, reactions can be called exergonic. An exergonic reaction is going to release energy. So think those hand warmers that you can buy for hunting or whatever. Or they can be ener endergonic, which requires energy. So think of those those uh, ice packs that you just have to break something and they get cold. That would be an endergonic reaction. All right, next topic is, first we have some questions. So in what type of reaction are bonds formed? And the correct answer would be synthesis. I guess we would accept exchange also. Uh, the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body cells is called and the correct answer is D, metabolism. Okay, next topic is water. Important properties of water. Important functions of water in the body. Uh, one is lubrication. Uh, it's found in most of our joints and it allows us to move freely. Uh, we'll talk about that more uh, when we talk about joints in chapter 8. Another important function of water is reactivity. Uh, we mentioned dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis reactions already. Uh, water is involved in a lot of chemical reactions in our body. Another thing is it has a very high heat capacity. That means it takes a lot of energy to turn water from, for example, water into gas or from water into ice, a solid. Um, so that means it takes a lot of energy to, since you're mostly water, that means it takes a lot of energy to turn you from water into a solid or a gas. So that's one way that you are able to maintain your body temperature. And then a third thing is solubility. Uh, we, we mentioned this before with water. And if we look at this, here's a close-up on how water molecules are dissolving this crystal of sodium chloride. Remember, since it's an ion and it has either positive or negative charges, um, the partial negative charges on the water molecule, sorry, partial positive, are going to be attracted to the chloride. And the partial negatives on the water are going to be attracted to these positive on the sodium. So that's how it helps dissolve. crystals, and it will also dissolve things that are not ions, like glucose. Next topic is pH. So this is a water molecule, uh, and hydrogen, hydrogen ions can easily lose their electrons to become hydrogen ions, which are very reactive in water. So this water molecule has split up into a hydrogen ion. Uh, this is basically hydrogen, a hydrogen atom that lost its electron. And these are very reactive in water. Here's a hydroxide ion. Uh, these hydrogen ions, they can break bonds, change the shape of complex molecules, and disrupt cell function. So because of this, our hydrogen ion concentration which we measure as pH, is very tightly regulated. So here's the uh, pH scale. Um, here's neutral. If you're right at 7, that means you have equal numbers of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, so that would be considered pure water. Uh, down here we have stomach acid, which is very acidic. Uh, over here we have like ammonia and oven cleaner. These things are very basic. Our blood is around 7.4, and again, it's it's in a range of 7.35 to 7.45. Um, it's one of those things that's maintained in homeostasis, so as long as it's in that range, we're okay. Um, we're going to talk about proteins in a minute, but one thing that happens uh, when the pH changes is it changes the shape of proteins, and we'll see that their structure determines their function. So if we 
mess up their structure, if we change their structure by changing the pH, then we'll change that function. Okay, this is an example of an acid. Something that releases hydrogen ions, which are basically protons, is an acid. So hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. And something that would accept hydrogen ions is a base. So here's sodium hydroxide. It's a base. It will release uh, these hydroxide ions, which will accept a hydrogen ion and form water. This is a buffer. Buffers stabilize the pH of a solution by either accepting or replacing hydrogen ions. So this is carbonic acid, so it can either lose a hydrogen ion if needed, or it can accept a hydrogen ion uh, to become carbonic acid again. And it helps stabilize the pH of a solution. We'll talk about that more actually next semester. Okay, next topic is organic molecules or organic compounds. So first of all, this is salt. It is not organic because it does not contain carbon. This is glucose and it is organic. Organic compounds contain carbon. And we're going to talk about some different types of organic compounds. Uh, the first one is carbohydrates. Uh, glucose is an example of a carbohydrate. Their main function is to serve as energy for the cell. Uh, they can exist like this. This is called a monosaccharide uh, because they're just one. They can join together, glucose and fructose join together to form sucrose, which is table sugar. That's called a disaccharide. Or they also exist as very long chains called polysaccharides. Uh, this is glycogen, uh, this sort of starch. Uh, this is how our bodies store glucose. It's how we store energy. Next type is lipids. Fats, oils, and waxes are all lipids. These type of molecules, they're insoluble in water. Uh, you've probably seen that oil and water don't mix. And that's true in our bodies as well. Um, this is an example of a fatty acid. You can see lots of carbon in it, long carbon chain. And these carbon chains are stored as triglycerides. Here's a triglyceride. Um, three fatty acids will join to a glycerol to form a triglyceride, and that's how we store fat. That's how we store energy in our bodies. Uh, another type of lipid are eicosanoids and steroids. Uh, these are signaling molecules. You've probably heard of estrogen and testosterone. They're hormones. Uh, they're derived from cholesterol. They're made from cholesterol, but they're converted in our body into estrogen or testosterone. And they're very important signaling molecules. So there are lots of functions for lipids in our body. Uh, the next type is a phospholipid. This looks like a triglyceride, but one of the fatty acids here has been replaced by a uh, phosphate. Uh, so here's the phosphate group. So that's a phospholipid. And then this here is a glycolipid where a carbohydrate binds to the glycerol instead of one of the fatty acids. Uh, these phospholipids and glycolipids, they're important in forming cell membranes. And the way they do this, first of all, if you put them in water, they'll join together to form what's called a micelle. Uh, because the phosphate part of them, or the, the carbohydrate part of them, likes water, uh, the tails are what's called hydrophobic, or, or water-fearing. They don't like water. So they'll, they'll come together, they'll stick together, and form these micelles. So 
is parts that don't like water are, are on the inside, the parts that do like water are on the outside, they kind of protect these parts. Um, and we'll talk in the next chapter about uh, how phospholipids form cell membranes. Next type of molecule is a protein. Proteins do the work of cells uh, in the enzymes, which do work, are going to be proteins. There are a lot of structural proteins. Uh, the main structural protein in our bones is called collagen. So most of our body is made up of proteins, and proteins also do the work of cells. Uh, proteins are formed from amino acids. Here are two amino acids at the top, glycine and alanine. Uh, they, they're joined by what's called a peptide bond, and that's water is formed as well. That's a dehydration synthesis reaction. So proteins are formed from amino acids joined by peptide bonds. Uh, they're also called polypeptides. There are 20 different types of amino acids, and they form all of our body's proteins. And you don't have to worry about the different types of amino acids right now. So a typical protein contains a thousand amino acids, and they're joined together. And here's some examples of completed proteins. Uh, as we saw before, we saw in our bodies that structure determines function. The structure of a protein determines its function. Uh, and there are different levels of structural orga organization in proteins. The first level is called primary structure. And primary structure is determined by the sequence of amino acids. So these could all be different amino acids in that sequence that's called their primary structure. Then there are some examples of secondary structure. Secondary structures are formed by hydrogen bonds between amino acids. So again hydrogen bonds they're not forming molecules but they're important for this. Um, and the most common secondary structures are, are called alpha helices. There's an alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. And then we have tertiary structure. Tertiary structure results from the complex coiling and folding that gives a protein its final three-dimensional shape. So these alpha helixes and beta sheets might fold on top of each other. Um, and in this case, there's something else added. Um, and then in some cases, there is quaternary structure as well. Quaternary structure comes from the interaction of different polypeptides to form a protein complex. So this is hemoglobin. You've probably heard of it. It's found in your blood. We'll learn all about it next semester. Uh, but it's made from four different subunits like this that come together to form the protein. Uh, here's collagen. Uh, it also has a quaternary structure. It comes from three of these they look like coils, and they're coiled together to form collagen. Uh, so that's protein structure. Enzymes are proteins that regulate reaction rates. Um, we're going to learn about a lot of different enzymes. They do a lot of the work of cells. In this case, this enzyme is facilitating the joining of these two things by bringing them closer together. So enzymes are proteins that regulate reaction rates. Uh, the next molecule we're going to talk about, organic compound, is called ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's made of adenine, ribose, and then it's got these three uh, phosphate groups. Um, ATP is used for storing energy, and these bonds right here have a lot of energy in them. That's how the energy is stored, and that energy um, can be used to form work. So AT, ADP 
plus energy plus a phosphate forms ATP and that can be used to do work uh, such as causing a muscle to contract or any different type of work. Next molecule we need to talk about is nucleic acids. You've probably heard of DNA and RNA. Uh, they're nucleic acids. They're primary function is storage and transfer of information. So all of your cells contain DNA and we're going to talk much more about it in the next chapter on cells. But it stores all the information that your cells need. Um, these nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides. Here's one nucleotide. It's made up of a phosphate group, a sugar, which can be either ribose or deoxyribose and then a nitrogenous base. Um, and these join together uh, to form the nucleic acids. And there will be a, a very long chain of these. Something like this. And the sequence of these bases carries the information necessary for making proteins. And we're going to talk about that uh, more in chapter 3. So that is the chemistry you need to know for this class. Again, if it's been a while since you've had a chemistry class or if you've never had a chemistry class, I would encourage you to go to Mastering a &P and review the Introduction to Chemistry. It's Chapter 2. Um, if you have any questions, email me or ask on, the, on our class discussion board. And I will see you next chapter.